This evening, I want you to think about the mission that the Historical Society took on last year when we took over the village. And it says, we collectively, and I put myself in that lot of we, we learn from the past to better understand the present so we can build a better future. I believe that between 1805 and 1813, Detroit faced serious challenges, including homelessness, resizing and rebuilding their community, and reinventing themselves in the region. Sound familiar? And that the Michigan Territory was confronted with the fear of terrorism from Native Americans. And at the same time, the nation, the United States, was confronted with war. And that war came right to Detroit. So see what you think. See how our past informs today. And then we each as individuals and as a society are going to have to decide how we go forward how we learn from that, this past, and does it inform us as we go forward. So the first question I have tonight is, what did Detroit look like in 1805? How did the people live? There was a man named George Harriet who was born in Scotland, and he worked as the deputy postmaster for uh, postmaster General for British North America. So he was a Brit. He traveled frequently in the Great Lakes region, and I'm going to read you a, a, a portion of his description of life in the settlements along the Detroit River. Now remember, this is a time, 1805 to 1807, when there was free travel back and forth between, on the Detroit River from what we now view as the Canadian side to the American side. The river was simply the road. Okay? Here's what he said. On the banks of the strait, the settlements are frequent, particularly on the western or American border. Adjoining almost every house, there is an orchard. The improvements are extensive and executed with taste. Peaches, Grapes, apples, and every other species of fruit are here produced in the greatest perfection and abundance. The lands on either side yield in fertility to none on the continent of America, and this territory may not improperly be viewed as the garden of the north. In passing through the strait, when the fruit trees are in blossom, the scene is gratifying and rich. In the vicinity of Sandwich, and Sandwich was just south of what is now Windsor, is a mission of the Hurons. Now, the picture you see on the screen was done in the early 1800s and depicts the log homes of the ribbon farmers. And you will see that in front of each one is a canoe or a bateau because that was their mode of transportation. Everyone wanted to live along the river because that's how they got from point A to point B. The old town and the fort, and I'm going to continue with George's description because it's much better than anything I could tell you. The old town, which you see in the foreground, and the fort, the star up at the top, which in 1796 was transferred to the government of the United States, is situated on the western border of the river, about nine miles below Lake St. Clair. It contained upwards of 200 houses. Hear that? 200 houses. The streets were regular, and it had a range of barracks of neat appearance with a spacious parade on the southern extremity. So if you look below the fort, there's sort of a triangular shaped piece that's parade ground and gardens, and it was on a slope. So imagine 
the fort on the top of the rise, so it had the vantage over the river, and then a slope, which was the parade ground and the gardens, and the commons where livestock could graze, commonly owned property. And you crossed the river Savoyard, and then you were down at the bottom of the hill on the riverbank, and that's where all the houses are squished. And the whole thing is surrounded by a stockade or picket, okay? And he's going to describe that. The fortifications consist of a stockade of cedar posts and was defended by bastions, lumps of earth, made of earth and pickets. Pickets were driven into the ground. They were sharp. They were pointed outwards so that it was like um, spears facing the Native Americans who might come and want to attack. So they were, and on the fortifications were mounted pieces of cannon sufficient to resist the hostile efforts of the Indians or of an enemy unprovided with artillery that they could lob over the top. The garrison in times of peace consisted of about 300 men commanded by a field officer who discharged all the functions of civil magistrate. All right, now, I want you to notice that each of the little squares is numbered. I think the writer was confused. Not 300 houses, but 300 people. There seemed to be about 50 habitations. OK? Yeah? How big is that? OK, now this is the part that's interesting, and I want you to put this in your head. This portion. Two acres. The Troy Historic Village is three acres. The fort is probably an acre and a half. This will give you more perspective. The map that you see here is that drawing, and it's overlaid on a city street map from 1880. In the circles, the top circle says Griswold. The horizontal circle is Jefferson. So when you look at this, most of the houses were between Jefferson and Atwater. Most of the houses could fit on the footprint of the Renaissance Center. We're talking about 50 little houses crammed in a very tight space. Imagine 300 people living in, the Tro in two thirds of the Troy Historic Village. Okay? Now, then you go up the hill to the fort. That's why in downtown Detroit we have Fort Street. That's where the fort was. Does that give you some perspective? Okay. What's the squiggly line thing? The Savoyard, which is now the, the river. And there are three small streams that used to be right in downtown Detroit that are now underground and are basically drainage pipes. Now, there were more people in Detroit than those living, when they talk about town, they refer to within the fortification, okay? Along the riverbanks, going all the way up to Gross Point and all the way down river toward Brownstown were the ribbon farms, and we've all heard about the ribbon farms. The habitants who lived on the river farms that extended north and south along the river lived outside the fort. They're the houses that were depicted in the first slide. They're the ones who considered the river as their road. And their lots were not very wide, less than 100 yards, probably 60 yards wide, but they ran anywhere from a half mile to a mile and a half inland. 
which is why they were called ribbon farms. And we know the names, Du Bois, St. Aubin, all those French names that we still see as street names in downtown Detroit. The French ancestors who established the ribbon farms had bought or bartered for their land from the Native Americans and the French government 100 years ago. Remember, Detroit was a very old community founded in 1701. This community was 100 years old in 1805. So these were descendants of the first French habitants, and some of them had gotten their land through agreements with Cadillac and the French government. And in most cases, there was no written documentation giving them ownership of the land. By the way, this map was done much later, 1810. Now, to give us more perspective, We've got to remember timeline. And for me, who still is learning history, I always want to know the timeline. After the American Revolution, which concluded in 1783 with the Treaty of Paris, the British simply hung around. They didn't leave the forts and settlements that they had established in the Northwest. They didn't leave Detroit after the war was concluded. They just stayed. And commerce continued between Sandwich, present-day Windsor, down to Fort Malden, at um, Amherstburg, and then out to the Great Lakes. Remember, this was a great thoroughfare for the fur trade. The British didn't want to leave. And everyone had a canoe, a boat. That was the method of transportation. In 1787, two critical documents were approved. The Northwest Ordinance, which outlined how the Northwest Territory and other lands that the United States would acquire would proceed on the pathway to statehood. The rules, procedures, and policies that would be followed. Those were all laid out in the Northwest Ordinance. And it was passed in 1787, the same year that the folks in Philadelphia, the Continental Congress, approved the Constitution, which was ratified two years later. It wasn't until 1796, with, the Jays, with Jay's Treaty, that the Brits actually left Detroit. And the American flag flew over the fort again. So now we recognize the border between British Canada, which was the river, and the United States, which was Detroit. It was an international border. Ohio becomes a state in 1803. So that hunk of the West Northwest Territory marches on to statehood. And the government then carved out the Michigan Territory from the remainder of the Northwest Territory. And now it's to receive a territorial governor and proceed on the pathway. Make sense? We also have to stop and remember the national politics in play. All of us know, especially right now, that who controls the presidency, the Senate, what is the prevailing ideology of the country at the time, affects all of us. And at that time, there were two ideologies, political ideologies, in vogue. Those were the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. Now, the Federalists included, or the leadership included, Alexander Hamilton, John Adams, John Jay, and George Washington. And they believed in a strong federal government. Articles of Confederation were not working. They put their support in a strong US Constitution and a strong federal government. They were nationalistic. The United States as a nation was their priority. They also were strong proponents of fiscal responsibility. The other ideology that was dominant at that time were the Republicans, more aptly called Democratic Republicans. And you can't 
overlay the Republican philosophy of today on that party completely, okay? It was a different time, we're just using the same word. And the proponents of the Republican Party at that time were Jefferson and Madison. And they were after personal rights, liberty, your unalienable rights that cannot be voted away, states' rights. They also were strong proponents of personal liberty, okay? Who's in office in 1805? Jefferson. So, in the, um, it's important to also realize that according to the Northwest Ordinance, the president, with approval of the Senate, appoints the territorial governor. And the three other appointees are three judges. Those four people are the entire legislative body of the entire territory. So there's no legislature and judicial and executive. It's all lumped into four guys. On top of that, the laws that are already in force in the existing states now apply to the territory. So whatever is the law in New England in the 13 original states, those are the laws in the territory. And the only way that the governing board, the four, can establish new laws in the territory is with approval by Congress. So in fact, there is no citizens' rights in the territory. It's all by Congress, controlled by the four. And Jefferson, because he's the president, he appoints people with his ideology. The first is William Hull. He's appointed um, the uh, territorial governor. A little bit about Hull. Born in Danbury, Connecticut, 1753, graduate of Yale at 19, and admitted to the bar by the time he's 22. He was cited for bravery during the American Revolution he fought very nobly. And following the war, he served as a justice of the peace for 19 years in Massachusetts and held the rank of major general in the Massachusetts militia. So he's with the citizens' army, the volunteers, but he doesn't actively participate in the regular army anymore. Um, he was, uh, in 1802, he became a state senator. He was a loyal Democratic Republican. In other words, he backed Jefferson. He was tall, handsome, and courtly. However, he was known not to be a good administrator. He was rather arrogant and indecisive. And the word on the street was, as he got older, he got timid. And he was really afraid of Indian attacks. Augustus Woodward. Here's the character. He was born in 1774. He was baptized Eli Elias Brevert Woodward because his uncle was a Dutch burgher lot of money. Uh, he selected the name Augustus on his own as he got older. His dad was a middle class merchant. He was bankrolled by his uncle uh, to attend Columbia, where he received a very good education. He spoke Greek, Latin, and French. Hull did not speak French. So the territorial governor did not speak the language spoken in Detroit. French was the language spoken in Detroit in 1805. Hull did not speak it. Woodward did. Um, he um, held a number of jobs, clerked, moved around, bought property. But in 1795, he got an invitation to Monticello where he met Jefferson and he fell in love. He fell in love with Thomas Jefferson. He idolized the man. And he also, then he moved to Washington and he was completely taken with L'Enfant's Washington plan. He pasted a picture of it in his notebook, a notebook that he always carried and jotted little sayings down. Um, he was quite the physical figure, six foot three, very skinny, stooped, sallow complexion. He had a long face and a big nose. He was vain about his hair. One time he got a bad haircut and he wore a hat for three weeks until it grew out. 
He was slovenly, not unlike Jefferson. And he slept in his office, which he never swept. He did not have a bookcase. He adored books, but they were stacked on the floors, on the tables, along with piles and piles and piles of paper. Sound like anybody you know? <laughs> he was not religious. He deplored sectarianism, but when he came to Detroit, one of his best friends was Father Gabriel Richard. I think if you peel back everything, this was a very decent man. So Jefferson, his friend, appointed him as judge. We don't know a lot about Frederick Bates, except he was trying to woo all the French girls who didn't like him. He was wealthy. He was uh, the son of a plantainer, plantation owner in Goochland County, Virginia. Was educated with private tutors and read law. Probably not a Federalist. Samuel Huntington denied the nomination to the Michigan Treasury, so Michigan was sure to judge. The other key player at that time was Stanley Griswold, another Jeffersonian who was appointed Secretary of the Territory, and he and Woodward were deemed contentious and often opposed Mr. Hull. These men arrived in Detroit about July 1st. However, the town of Detroit burned to the ground on June 11, 1805 three weeks before they arrived. Now the town that burned were those 50 structures inside the stockade. Not the fort, not the ribbon farms, the town itself. There's discrepancy on what caused the fire. The going legend was it was a man in a bakery who was going to go out and get more flour and he tapped the ashes out of his pipe in the, in the um, stable caught on the hay, and all the wood in that cramped little two-acre community was tinder dry, a hundred years old, flammable as anything, and it just went up like a match. The only thing left standing were a few chimneys and one warehouse. So the entire community of 300 residents was left homeless. And this is what Hull and Griswold and Woodward and Bates came to. And the one thing that Father Gabriel Richard, the good priest, said the day after the fire was, we hope for better things, it will rise from the ashes. He said it in Latin. Now if I can say it right. Speremus maloria resurrect cinerebus. And it became the motto for the city of Detroit. Well, poor Governor Hull. This is what he said. The place which bore the name, the town of Detroit, was a spot about two acres of ground, completely covered with buildings and combustible materials. The narrow intervals, or lanes, 14 or 15 feet, used as streets or lanes. And the whole was environed with very strong and secure defense of tall and solid pickets. The folly of attempting to rebuild the town in the original mode was obvious to every mind. Yet, there existed no authority, either in the country or in the officers of the new government to dispose of the ancient gro adjacent ground. Hence, had already arisen a state of dissension which urgently required the interposition of some authority to quiet. In other words, everybody was really in a terror, because all of them were homeless. Some of the inhabitants, destitute of shelter and hopeless of any proper arrangements of government, had reoccupied their former ground. And a few buildings had already been erected in the midst of the old rooms. Another portion of the inhabitants had determined to take possession of the adjacent public ground up the hill, the commons, which they had no right to and to throw themselves on the liberty of the government of the United States, either to make them a donation of the ground as compensation for their sufferings or to accept a very moderate price for it. Talk about Detroit in 1805. Compare it to Detroit today. 
Woodward opened his little notebook and said, I got a plan. He had pasted L'Enfant's Washington plan, which he loved. It was geometric, it was scientific, and he was a man of vision. And he said, this is what we should build. Let's build for the future. Let's think big. Let's do it. Here's the reaction, according to Woodward. I believe that your new metropolis is destined to no common name among the cities which embellish the continent of North America. It's going to be one of the best cities in the country. And that the melancholy conflagration of 1805 may, by a judicious improvement of the calamity, be almost converted into a blessing. Hey, guys, yeah, it burned, but we can be better. But then he says, all the attachment of the inhabitants is to the old spot. They value all the ground within the vicinity of the old town enormously rich, and all the rest it's scarcely worth anything. They have seen what their country has been for a hundred years past, and by this alone they judge of what it is likely to be for a hundred years to come. His plan, broad avenues, 200 feet wide, not 14, 200, smaller streets, 120 feet wide, 12 streets converge on circles, parks, public gathering spaces, the downtown where people can gather. Have we heard anyone in Troy ask for that? Six streets enter smaller squares. Public buildings will be in these spaces. Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., one of the greatest civic designers of our country, said a hundred years later, nearly all the most serious mistakes of Detroit's past have arisen from disregard of the spirit of the governor and Judge Woodward's plan. We had the opportunity to resize the city. I got to tell you that while this was Woodward's plan, the actual drawing was done by a man named Thomas Smith, a Welsh-born land surveyor who lived in Detroit as early as 1779 and who worked both sides of the river. It's important to note that Woodward did not include a fortification or a fort in his plan. He was envisioning a great city. Now, there were legal issues and restrictions from the Northwest Ordinance that got in the way with the redevelopment of Detroit on anything but its original footprint. But we've got homeless people who are living in the open or in crude shelters or who are bunking in with friends on the ribbon farms. And they're angry. I want my land. Keep in mind that the federal government, they had a goal in this too. They wanted to increase the population in Michigan. They wanted to sell land in Michigan to generate revenue for the federal government, and they wanted Michigan to become a state. Land was cheaper in Canada. If there was a legal obstruction to people coming in and repopulating Detroit, it was really easy to go across the river. Hull's role also was as an Indian agent. The job of the territorial governor was to make treaties with the Indians and acquire their land for the expansion of the country. So here we have a man who doesn't speak French, is afraid of Indian attacks, and he's got to deal with the Native American chiefs and get their land away from them. And he did a good job of doing it, but he didn't want French habitants squatting on their land and gumming up the works, okay? It was also his job to ensure public safety, which we still hear about. They didn't want the town to burn again, so they didn't want to rebuild on that original footprint and build another tinderbox. 
So Woodward and Hull pack up their bags and go to Washington to lobby Congress to pass legislation to give Michigan or give them the ability to confirm land titles that they would recognize and 10,000 additional acres of land to plat and sell. It's interesting. They get in Washington in October of 1805, but Congress is very w busy worrying about England and the possibility of war simmering, and they're too busy to worry about Michigan, so there is no decision until April, kind of like gridlock in Congress. Woodward said he spent $300 on wine to lobby the congressman. Keep in mind, he made less than $500 a year. Back in Michigan, they're all fighting over lots and how big they were and whether they liked Woodward's plan because if I get this lot, it's not big enough. Just give me 12 acres so I can grow enough wheat and corn and pears to feed my family. No houses were built in 1806 and only 19 deeds were awarded until May of 1807. At the same time, Hull has to recruit a militia. And they're all complaining because he was rather arrogant and he ordered very expensive fabric and plumes and buckles and brass buttons and they all had to pay for it and they didn't want to wear those big uniforms and they didn't want to march as much as he made them march. And so he wasn't making friends. Meanwhile, tensions between the United States and Britain are increasing. And there were four basic reasons why we credit the War of 1812 for happening. Number one, Britain once again is fighting with France. The United States traded with France. Britain didn't like that. And so they plant, passed 12 orders of council, which are the same as executive orders, passed by the king that um, restricted trade with Europe except through Britain. Three of them passed between 1807 and 1809 directly affected the United States. So it restricted neutral trade and instituted a naval blockade of Napoleonic France and its allies. So you can't trade with all of Europe, only Britain. And what's interesting is the orders of councils were reprieved on June 23rd, 1812. War was declared on the 25th. Tra you know, communication being what it was, nobody found out. The second cause was impressment. The United States held that People who were born in Britain who immigrated to the United States became naturalized citizens. They were not aliens. They were granted citizen status. Britain maintained they were still Brits who had deserted. And so the British started to approach U.S. ships under attack, board them, and impress naturalized British people and forced them to fight in the British Navy because Britain was at war with France and they needed 140,000 sailors to man 600 ships. And they ignored American, what American considered law. A form of terrorism, really, taking hostages. The third reason was this fear that the United States might try to annex Canada and the fact that the British would attack American ships, whether they were merchant ships or naval ships, and kill American citizens, dishonor at sea. The example of that that really got a lot of press was the conflict between the USS Ch Chesapeake and Her Majesty's, or His Majesty's ship, the Leopard, which happened on June 22, 1807. And the Leopard, the, the British ship, actually attacked and boarded the Chesapeake, 
and the Chesapeake was kind of caught off guard. They were in peaceful waters. Um, the captain, Barron, surrendered his vessel after firing only one shot. Four crew members were removed and were tried for desertion, and they hanged one of the crew members, an American citizen. The U.S. backed away from armed conflict at this point because Britain was such a huge power, and impressment continued. Back in the States, a couple of our local Native Americans, Tecumseh and his brother, were tired of and in fear of American expansion to the West. And they said, enough with these whites. Don't use their kettles, don't use their guns, don't eat their food, don't take their money. We are our tribes, reject them, and do not let them expand anymore. And while Hull was on an extended vacation back in Massachusetts, Tecumseh's brother, and the name is, I think, pronounced Tenskwatatwa, or the prophet, attacked William Henry Harrison's army at their encampment, that is the Native American encampment, at the confluence of the Wabash and Tippecanoe rivers. And the prophet was killed. Tecumseh's brother was killed. And his warriors were defeated, even though Harrison had a very small army. And the natives really just considered it a setback. They rebuilt Prophetstown, and frontier violence actually increased afterwards. So now we have Native Americans attacking farmers and settlers, and so we have local terrorism going on. All this sets us up for what happened in Detroit in 1812. And, this, and we all in school just learned that Governor Hall surrendered the city of Detroit without firing a shot, was court-martialed, was disgraced. Let's peel back a little bit more. The Secretary of War at that time was a man named William Eustace, who had no military experience at all. And he asked Governor Hull to not only be the governor, but to take command of the armed forces for the Michigan Territory. Hull is 59 years old. He has not put on a uniform for 26 years. He says no twice. But everybody else says no, too. And finally, he's forced into it. He's given the responsibility of marching 1,200 volunteer militia and a couple hundred regular army from Dayton, Ohio, to Detroit in the spring of 1812. He leaves on the 1st of June. Because of different circumstances, he figures the only way to get to Detroit is to hike through the Black Swamp. That's along the Ohio uh, shoreline along Lake Erie. This is miserable country. We're talking about slogging through mud and mosquitoes and building roads to do it. The Black Swamp is 50 miles long and 30 miles wide. On the 26th of June, he receives a letter from the Secretary of War dated June 18th, get to Detroit ASAP. Just get to Detroit. Doesn't say any more. So Hull wants to move faster. He puts his luggage, some women and children who are traveling with them, family members of these volunteers, medical supplies, and inadvertently the muster rolls for his company and the army records that have all of his information on it. He puts it on a ship called the Cuyahoga tells the captain, look, take the shallow channel on the eastern side of the Detroit River. Don't go in the deep channel, because you'll come very close to Fort Malden, 
which is held by the British. Go the hard way, not the easy way, and get this stuff to Detroit as quick as you can. We're marching as fast as we can. While they're still marching on the 2nd of July, he gets another letter from Eustace, also dated June 18th saying that the United States has declared war against Great Britain. It got stuck in a mail bag. Unknown to Hull, the ship he put all this stuff on, including the information about his troops, that ship went up the deep channel. The British took it, and now they have all his records. As he's marching north, what does he see on the Canadian side of the river? 2,000 Native Americans at Fort Malden. This is a man scared of an enemy attack by Native Americans, in addition to the British regulars. And on July 8th, he receives orders to attack the British and is also notified that the United States will not be attacking the British on the lakes of Lake, on Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, which means, buddy, you got no backup because we're not going to try and stop the British from coming up through the Great Lakes into the Detroit River, but you attack Fort Malden. Hull had approximately between 2,000 and 2,200 untrained, ill-equipped men and a fort full of women and children. On July 29th, he's informed that Fort Mackinac, the other settlement in the Michigan Territory up at the Straits, had surrendered to the British on July 17th. So now, the natives up north are going to side with the British and move south to Detroit. Think about what he was facing. So he delays the attack on Fort Malden because he's also notified that a large enemy force is headed towards him from Niagara. They're coming at him from every direction. It's going to be a slaughter. The attack on Malden is too risky. If he loses, the local natives will swarm Detroit and ravage the inhabitants that he is still responsible for as governor. If he wins, he doesn't have enough supplies to hold the fort because the British control the Great Lakes. What was it like to be in Detroit that week? This goes back to the Clark Library, which has these wonderful documents. So I'm going to sashay back and forth in their words. Uh, two journal entries, or two journals. One is from Lydia B. Bacon, whose husband, Josiah, was a quartermaster in the American Army. The other was Charles Askin, who served uh, in the British Army. What's really interesting, his dad was a leading Detroit businessman who lived in Canada. So he knew people on both sides of the river. August 12th, Lydia writes, our troops have vacated Sandwich and returned to this place. Since the enemy have been very busy on the opposite shore, building a battery, we suppose, as the ends project beyond a large building which covers them while they work. And at night, we can hear them throw their cannonballs from a boat to the land. So they're building a structure to house the cannon aimed right at Detroit. Lydia writes again on August 15th, a summons has been sent today from General B. Isaac Brock, commander of the English forces in Canada, to General Hull to surrender Detroit with the army to him. This general has not seen fit to comply with every and every preparation is being made for bombardment. So Hull says, no, I'm not surrendering. All the women and children are going into the fort as the only secure place against the Indians and the bombs. Saturday, 
um, oh, this is Saturday, August the 15th. Charles writes from the other side of the river, we are ordered to be in readiness at 4 o'clock next morning to march. 4 o'clock Sunday morning. Lydia writes on Sunday the 16th, as soon as Aurora, the sun's beautiful rays adorned the east, the cannon began to roar, apparently with tenfold fury. The enemy's shots began to enter the fort, and as some ladies were making cylinders, bags to hold powder, and scraping lint in case it should be wanted, a 24-pound shot entered the next door to the one they were in and cut two officers who were standing in the entry directly into their bowels. The same ball passed through the wall into a room where a number of people were and took the legs off one man and the flesh off the thigh of another. The person who had his legs shot off died in a short time. Soon after this, another ball of equal size entered the hospital room and a poor fellow who lay sick in bed had his head severed from his body instantly and his attendant was likewise killed. The enemy had got the range of the fort so completely that it is considered dangerous for the women and children to stay any longer in quarters, and we are all hurried to the root house on the opposite side of the fort, which was bombproof. Never shall I forget my sensation as I crossed the parade ground. Weep I could not, complain I would not, and I felt as if my nerves would burst, my hair felt as if it were erect on my head. On gaining the root house, I found it nearly full of women and children. What a scene was here presented. Such lamentation and weeping I have never heard before, and I sincerely hope I shall never again. Among all this number, but three were composed. Oh, I thought, what have I done, what have any of us done to deserve anything like this? About this time, the enemy landed on our side under their armed vessels. Oops, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read that part. OK, too much. Hull surrenders. She writes on, our soldiers were then marched onto the parade ground of the fort, where they stacked their arms, which were then delivered to the enemy. The American colors were taken from the staff of the fort and immediately replaced by English colors, and a royal salute fired from the very cannon taken from them in the Revolutionary War, while their music played God Save the King. A thousand emotions struggled in my breast, too numerous for utterance and too exquisitely painful to be described. The poor fellows that were shot in the contest were buried in one common grave. After the surrender, those who had fled the fort for safety returned to their respective abodes. Now Charles writes, I saw a number of the inhabitants, many of whom knew me and seemed happy to see me. Half of Detroit and a half of Detroit and there halted. From this place, sent a flag of truce. Oh, this is him describing the surrender. Sent a flag of truce to the garrison desiring them a second time to surrender. It was a long time before we had an answer, and therefore it was kept a long time in suspense. Many were wishing them not to capture, as these were young officers who were anxious to have the happy, distinct, the happy opportunity to distinguish themselves. They wanted the fight. But most of us wished, and I believe, they should be spared the loss of blood for the sake of the poor women and children who we knew would not be spared by the Indians should an action once commence. Fortunately for us, as it will appear afterwards, the Americans, after some time, capitulated and surrendered and made themselves prisoners of war. I forgot to mention that while we were marching up, a constant firing was kept up from our battery. There were about 2,300 prisoners surrendered, besides the militia of the Michigan Territory, who gave up their arms that day. The whole of the army were ill-dressed, and a few of them appeared healthy, and few of them appeared healthy or well. Indeed, they seemed to me the poorest-looking set of men I have seen in a long time. 
Well, Hull was disgraced. As a prisoner of war, he and the others were packed on a ship and sent to a Quebec. And then, after a period of time, he was transported back to Massachusetts. It took them a long time to finally try him for desertion. He was not found guilty of treason, but was found guilty of cowardice and behavior on becoming an officer. He was sentenced to death. He was to be shot. But the sentence was commuted because of his age, his poor health, and the fact that he had served his country so nobly during the American Revolution. He retired to Massachusetts and wrote two books trying to reclaim his lost honor. Woodward, who remained in the fort while it was held by the British, went from being scorned as the author of the Woodward Plan and considered just crazy to being heralded as a humanitarian and a hero. The British immediately wanted to appoint him Secretary of the Territory, and he said, I cannot accept an appointment by the enemy. It would be treason. He wrote a long letter to the federal government saying, I will not accept any money from the British and I will not accept their role, but I will act as an unofficial intermediary between the British and the Americans for the sake of the civilians who are held captive in the town. He worked very hard to get food, to find shelter for people, and to ransom prisoners of war because he, he felt strongly that if they were taken by the Native Americans, that they would be tortured. The battle in Frenchtown, the Battle of Ri the uh, River Raisin, only reinforced that. In that battle, 397 Americans were killed. And the day after the battle, the Native Americans tortured and killed an additional 300 people. And Woodward was infuriated by this action and felt that Proctor, who was in command of Detroit, should have done something to stop those actions. And so the working arrangement that he had with the British government and the local British leadership in Detroit fell apart. And he knew that he no longer could really be in a position to help the Detroiters. So he accepted his passport in February and left. Woodward went back to Washington. He was later sent to Florida as a territorial judge and served there for the rest of his life. No one knows exactly what he died of. He never married. He never left heirs. And no one knows exactly where he's buried. The Battle of Lake Erie, which will be commemorated in September uh, 2013, reclaimed the Great Lakes for the United States. And that victory allowed the Americans to re-enter Detroit and end the siege of Detroit and allow the community to grow. The next territorial governor to be appointed was Lewis Cass, one of the colonels who served under Hull. It's an interesting story. And I think there are many parallels to be drawn. But that's our job, isn't it? To learn from the past, to understand the present, so we can build something better in the future. Thank you.